Hi, everyone. My name is Josh Baumel. I am a medical oncologist at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and I am so pleased to welcome you to the Cancer Grace ASCO ESMO update. Uh, so this is, this is great. And I have some fantastic friends and colleagues here to talk about all the updates from head and neck cancer at these big conferences. So joining me today are Dr. Kate Gold uh, from the University of Cal uh, California, San Diego, Dr. Ronnie Mira from the University of Maryland, and Dr. Jared Weiss from the University of North Carolina. All right, so at this year's ESMO meeting, there was a positive study that was looking um, not at immunotherapy in, uh, in chemoradiotherapy for head and neck cancer. So we, all, we always get really excited about immunotherapy in recent years, but there are other ways to treat cancer. And so there was a new drug called uh, Zivinapant. Uh, or I'm impressed you can say that. Debio, I often say that as an oncologist, my primary job is to say impossible words quickly. Um, so in any case, um, Dr. Weiss, why don't you let us know what happened in this study of Zivinapant? Now I'm just showing off. So I can't say that. So I'm going to call it 1143. Um, so 1143 is a mechanism that I'll admit wasn't much on my radar. Um, this drug wasn't much on my radar. Uh, it's an inhibitor of apoptosis proteins. Uh, and to Dr. Mira's point, it actually is a radiation uh, that was in a prior podcast, so you should watch that one. Uh, but to Dr. Mira's point, it actually is a radiation sensitizer by mechanism. So um, it makes common sense to study concurrent uh, with radiation. Um, and here we had a randomized phase two study where half of the patients got the standard cisplatin radiotherapy. And the other half got that same standard of care with the addition uh, of 1143. Now, when we're looking at uh, at drugs as radiation sensitizers, the traditional measure is local regional control, which in planar English is how well cancer is controlled at the site that you're radiating. This is obviously not what we care about ultimately from a human perspective, but it's helpful for understanding if drug is doing what it's supposed to do. It's an important part of the story, particularly for early stage investigations. And what we had um, at ESMO uh, was uh, three-year data on local regional control, uh, and it was a nice improvement. It went from 56% uh, in the control arm of chemo rads. And you could argue for the risk of the population, whether that was as good as it should have been. We'll get there. Um, but a nice improvement up to 78%. So a, a pretty big difference um, in the experiment, experimental arm. Now, as I mentioned, from a human perspective, we care about controlling cancer everywhere, not just at one spot, and that's the measure of PFS, or progression-free survival. So PFS is a curve that starts with everyone alive and without their cancer growing, and it ticks down every time uh, a cancer either grows or a patient dies. And since none of us make uh, it off the planet alive, they would eventually all uh, end uh, at zero. But in the early parts of the curve, the first few years really reflect what's going on with cancer. And here, the difference was, if anything, broader. Um, in the uh, control arm, we were at 36%. Uh, and in the exper experimental arm, we were at 72%. 72% of patients at uh, three years without growth of cancer or death. And of course, the most objective measure we have, uh, and from a human perspective, after quality of life, probably the most important one is survival. Um, and at three years, that was 51 versus 66%. Rounding out the picture of what happened here is the question of what the cost was. The, I'm talking about the human cost in terms of toxicity. Um, and here there was a little bit, but if this data turned out to be true, it was confirmed in a phase three study, um, I would say it was worth it. In exchange for these improved outcomes, we had a little more uh, dysphagia, which means trouble swallowing, a little more mucositis, which means pain in the mouth, uh, and a little more anemia, which is uh, low red blood cell count. Um, but really, I would argue nothing terrible. Um, and the consequence of this is that there uh, is a phase three study, which I would argue is both necessary and warranted here. Um, and it has a, a name. I have no idea how they came up with this name, but it's called Trilinex. Yeah, I think that one thing that does need to be emphasized here when we look at this study is who was enrolled in this study. So if we look at the study, um, there were, they were all previous heavy smokers 
Um, and they over 80% of the oral pharyngeal cancer, which is one of the most common cancers here, were HPV and P16 negative. That is the literal opposite of what I see in my practice, where about 80% of the head, oral pharyngeal head and neck cancer I see is P16 positive. Um, so these cancers, these are very aggressive tumors. So the fact that they saw good results is, is wonderful. But what it highlights for me is the heterogeneity of these cancers, where some of these are really bad actors. And I worry that they were unable to balance for that sort of unknown heterogeneity in such a small phase two study. You know, I think this was a really exciting study. I liked that they picked a high risk group of patients. You know, the patients that they selected for the study, as you mentioned, were smokers, were mostly HPV negative. These are people that our standard treatments haven't changed a lot over the past couple decades, and we know the outcomes aren't very good. So like Dr. Weiss, I didn't have incredibly high expectations for this study when I first heard about it and was pretty surprised in a good way by the data. I mean, I agree that it's not standard after the phase two trial, but the phase three trial I think is necessary and I'm really excited to see what happens with it. This seems to be something that is tolerable, um, that can help people with a bad prognosis tumor potentially live longer and I'm excited to see what comes next. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's it's even just exciting to have a, a, a rationale for a phase three trial and to be able to answer the question. And we've certainly been surprised before when we've seen phase three data. So, you know, I think we all remember our TAG0522, where there was a lot of hope with the combination of cetuximab and cisplatin, and that ended up being with radiation, and that ended up being negative. So we'll just have to see what the phase three data shows. But um, I think the preliminary data looks, looks really intriguing. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because we had just talked about how we weren't seeing this benefit with the addition of immune checkpoint inhibitors with radiation. And, um, you know, this mechanism really does act more um, directly related to the, the, the cellular damage that you would want to see with, with a sensitizer with, with radiation. But there also are some potential immune effects of this agent, which, um, you know, I think are kind of interesting to, to think about. And, uh, especially when we don't really haven't seen as robust data with the immune checkpoint inhibitors with with, with radiation. I, I think it just highlights that we really still have a, a lot to learn how to uh, impact our immune response when we're giving radiation therapy. Yeah, and I think that the fact that the toxicity that got worse, um, you know, the trouble swallowing, the pain in the mouth, um, that those are really consistent with radiation doing more of its job one of the worries when you combine something like an apoptosis, and apoptosis, by the way, for those who are watching or listening, uh, apoptosis is one of the ways cells die. And so inhibiting that is somewhat problematic, potentially, in terms of could this make cancer cells live more. Um, but the fact that those side effects got worse, that the swallowing got worse and the pain in the mouth got a little bit worse, is a bit reassuring to me. It makes me feel like, okay, this is make the radiation more active in the in the head and neck. And so that is um, an optimistic. I agree. I think doing the phase three study is a, is a great option. I just, we'll have to see. We've been tricked before, as you said, Dr. Mira, in terms of phase two data, and then we see the phase three and there's some regression to the mean. So I'm going to be with Dr. Mir here and being excited about some of the uh, immune stimulating activity because you could cure cancer without immunotherapy and no one would pay attention to you these days. Um, but, I, you know, it makes what is it, what's exciting to me is that it makes a lot of sense here, right? The idea here was supposed to be a radiation sensitization for longer than I can remember. We've been hearing about the potential for radiation to be a kind of vaccine that cancer cells die and the immune system can see that. And you can see my skepticism for that and for my colleagues uh, smiling and laughing, maybe them too. But here you have... Uh, specific effects that make some common sense that it could actually be true, particularly on the mechanisms by which um, uh, our show and tell cells of the immune system, our dendritic cells, um, activate our killer cells, our T cells of the immune system. There's a story here that actually made a little bit of common sense to me um, that it might be true, but I would also note um, that for those of us practicing in the tobacco belt, um, a study of 
uh, for uh, HPV negative patients uh, might be a little bit more exciting than for those of us uh, in the Northeast. Um, and there's a lot of smoking still going on in the U.S. and in the world, a lot of smoking related uh, head and neck cancer. And it's really nice to see in advance um, for, those, for those patients. They badly needed it for some time.